hearts would be ready to receive it. And also, Lord, that the, the lips that preach it would be uh, touched by the hot coal from heaven. And uh, we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, all. Um, I hope you all had safe travels coming here. I want to start off with a little story about a man, a young man. Uh, he was very disrespectful to his, seems like I have an echo coming back, maybe. Anyways, he's very disrespectful to his parents. Um, he was a blasphemer. He was a drug addict. Um, he was not the kind of person you probably want in your circle, although Jesus probably would have had, his, had him in his circle. Amen? Amen. Um, so all these things that he did, he wasn't the greatest person. And um, I'd like to leave, I'd like to finish this story, but I think we're going to go through the sermon first. So I'm going to leave you on a cliffhanger, so remember that. Okay, so I have a nice little fancy PowerPoint slide that my wife made me. So our sermon title is called Converted. And our main scripture is coming from Luke 22, 31 through 32. And it says, And the Lord Simon, Simon said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And you see there, bold word, converted. And you want to think, Peter was with Jesus. How is he not already converted? The same may be with us. We come to church. We maybe go to prayer meeting. Are we converted, though? Do we live a life that testifies of that? I think it's important to put our name here. And the Lord said, Daniel, Daniel, behold, Satan hath desired me as well as all of you. Now, I want to look at the definition of converted so we get an understanding. I think this is from Webster's Miriam. As an adjective of a building, it says, having been adapted to be suitable for a new purpose. We should all want that desire, right? To be a new purpose. As a verb, it is to cause to change in form, character, or function. Now, how many of us have characters that are faulted? If you don't raise your hand... I'm going to talk to you after church. <laughs> okay, but what is conversion spiritually? Now, I'm going to take comparisons of Peter before conversion and after conversion. Now, the first point that I want to bring up to you is prideful. And we all may feel this at times. And this comes from Luke 22, 24 to 26. It says, Now there was also a dispute among them. And for context, this is right after the Last Supper. This was... Jesus just told them that one of them should betray them, betray him, and here they are disputing who would be the greatest. It says, as to which of them should be considered the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors, but not so among you. So there may be times where we um, compare ourselves to others in the church. Anybody? Okay. Probably shouldn't, but it happens. These are people, these are apostles. These are people, I'm comparing myself to Brother Joe over there. I'm comparing myself to them. We should be comparing ourselves to Christ, amen? amen. Um, and, um, you know, it says here that kings exercise lordship over the Gentiles. We're all going to be kings in heaven, or queens. Um, and so sometimes we seek to think that we're going to be... We need to be served here on earth. But really, even Jesus was humble enough to serve others. And what we should do as well. Not just in the church, but those outside the church. Um, but the two should go hand in hand. If we're serving in the church, we're obviously going to reach out to the community and serve hand in hand with that. Um, now the comparison is humility, or humble I put up here. And this is, as, this is Acts 10, you know, as uh, Cornelius called for him. Cornelius was a high-status person. And whenever Peter came to him, he, came, he bowed down before him. But Peter, this took years after Jesus, you know, had already died and ascended to heaven, rose from the dead, ascended to heaven. It took years before Peter had learned this. It says, Cornelius... Uh, fell down and worshipped at his feet. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. 
And as he talked with them, he went in and found many who had come together. And he said to them, you know how unlawful it is for a Christian man to keep company with a sinner. Do we think that sometimes? Do we think that we should only have friends that are in the church? I don't think so. I think uh, we should have the same spirit as Christ and that we should not call any man common or unclean. Just because they struggle with something doesn't mean that they can't come to Christ as well as we did. Um, Yeah, others are struggling with things that we may have struggled with in our past, and we're still struggling with them, amen? No one's perfect here. And so we should have... Conversion would cause, the, cause us to have sympathy on these people. Um, and just so you know, Cornelius was praying for Peter, to God, for him to send someone to them to preach the word. There's somebody out there waiting for you to be that Peter to them. How many times do we drive by a person that needs help and say, ah, oh, someone will get him, I'll just pray for him. Peter was also praying before this, but he was told to help, and he went. He traveled a lot farther than we probably would ever have to, to uh, help the person that's in need. Um, Okay, look at point number two here. Before conversion, Peter has wavering faith. How many of us have wavering faith? Sometimes. Sometimes. Now, you know the context of this story. Jesus, uh, the apostles are in the boat, and Jesus is walking on the water. And Peter sees him and calls out to him and says, Lord, if it is you, command me to come down to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And the beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And then Jesus says, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? How many times do we go through each day of life having our struggles? We can look at the winds as the trials in our life, right? How many times is it, oh man, my car's not working. How am I going to get to work? And then we doubt that God cannot take care of us. I've had many truck problems this past year. I haven't missed one work day because of it. And um, so we should always remember that God is in control of our life. We should not doubt that he will do what he says he's going to do. Because doubt creates a sinkhole in our life. And if we continue to doubt, we're going to continue sinking farther and further away from Christ. Um, There may be many things that are going on. We may be going through family crises. Crises? Crises? We may be going through family struggles, right? The loss of a loved one. Um, a son, daughter that may be strung out, just a typical wife and husband argument. But we should always continue to believe that God wants us to have a better life. Not just physically, but spiritually. That's the most important thing, because we need to be a people prepared for heaven. It doesn't matter about the things here on earth. Um, And after conversion, we see that Peter has confident faith. It says, but Peter and the other apostles answered and said, okay, so for context, this is um, the Sanhedrin had brought the apostles before him, before them, because in chapter 3 of Acts, they had healed a lame man. There's a little song, you know, John and Peter went to pray and met a lame man on the way. You might know that little song. But this is what it's talking about. They want to know um, who he had healed in the name of. And it says, But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men, because they were told not to preach in this name. And we are witnesses to these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey Him. That's a big word for us Christians. We kind of think that, you know, obeying is legalism, but the Holy Spirit is given to those who obey Him. And when they, the Sanhedrin, had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Um, how many has ever been beaten up and just like ran away? Just, I, mean, I don't know if any of y'all have been in fights before, but 
I've been beat up before. I didn't run away and shout and leap for joy. You know, my head was hanging low and... <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so the confidence here is, is that even though they were beaten, they're still, there comes another time where Peter and Paul are brought before them and they're imprisoned again. And uh, not Paul, sorry, um, John. And they're imprisoned for preaching in the name. They were so confident that God was going to carry them through, that he had a better life for them, that they did not stop to think at all, ever doubt that God would not take care of them. Um, and I just think of this as you may be going through, um, you know, things in your life that you may be struggling with. Whereas, like, I remember when the Sabbath became an issue for me at my work. They told me that if I miss three Saturdays that I'm going to be fired. And I just told my boss, okay, thank you. That's, that was the end of that conversation. And I still work there, and it's been over a year now, a little more maybe, um, but I was confident, and you may, some of y'all may be struggling with this, you know, struggling to keep the Sabbath. But you have to remain confident that God is going to carry you through. He can find another job. That's nothing for God. He can provide, even when the money is low at the end of the rent, or at the, at the end of the month. Um, and sometimes even having confidence that, um, confidence can be when someone is speaking ill of us, Right? Instead of self-doubting ourselves, we know our worth in Christ. Now, we should probably pray for those people who speak badly of us. And that can be hard because that's a sign of humility. Back to the first point. Let's look at point number three. Now, Peter, before conversion, he was a Christ denier. And I can say this for myself as well. Before I was converted, I was a Christ denier. Anybody else can say that, probably? Unless you were raised in the church, maybe. And, um, um, this, this text is kind of small. I'm going to read it from up here. It says, Now Peter sat outside in the courtyard. And this is context. This is um, Jesus had been taken um, by night you know, to uh, be put on trial. And then Peter's out in the courtyard. And a servant girl came to him, saying... You also were with Jesus of Galilee, but he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you are saying. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, This fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth, but again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And a little later, those who stood, up, stood by came up and said to Peter, Surely you are also one of them, for your speech betrays you. Then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. Say, Christians don't cuss. Peter's cussing here. And this was a big struggle for me, because I grew up in a household for, with uh, potty mouth family members. And, um, but through prayer and grace, God has allowed me to not cuss. Sometimes it slips, and we should ask for forgiveness for that. But sometimes, you see here it says, Surely you are also one of them, for your speech betrays you. Isn't it true that the, our speech can betray us for the opposite reason? We take on the name of Christ, and then we talk differently. We're cursing, we're cussing, maybe saying things that we shouldn't be talking about. And then people look at that, and they say, Weren't you supposed to be with Christ? Hmm. And a friend of mine told me that, you know, um, one of the commandments is take, do not take the Lord's name in vain. But when we put on Christ's name and we do not act the same that Christ would, that's us taking his name in vain. It's not just saying the GD as some people would say it is, you know. So... It's almost better, it's like Jesus said, I'd rather you be hot or cold than be lukewarm. So if we're saying one thing, acting a different way, Jesus would rather you be cold if we're not taking on that, that right garment. <clears throat> now we look at Peter after conversion was claiming Christ. This seems pretty simple. 
I don't think anybody necessarily here would say that Christ didn't die and resurrect from the grave. But how boldly did he do it? And for context, again, this is still even being um, whenever they healed the lame man. After Peter had already preached a sermon on Solomon's porch and led 5,000 to believe, the elders even heard this of Israel, but they still came back and asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, now this is key, because we're not going to speak boldly if we're not filled with the Holy Spirit. And if we're not studying Scripture, we're not praying, we're only coming to church once a week, when the doors are open multiple days of the week, it's going to be hard to be filled with the Spirit. Because iron sharpens iron, as we talked about in our um, early morning prayer today. It says, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter, so whenever we talk about Christ, are we bold? Or do we just say, yeah, Jesus kind of helped me with that and just you know, brush it off as if it's nothing? Whenever... Whenever the things that we do, the works that we do, doesn't have to be necessarily healing a lame man. But the work of repentance, that's, I mean, we should praise God for that, right? People should see that in our lives. The things that we used to do, we no longer do. Um, I can think of many things that I used to do that I no longer do. And when people ask me why I'm changed, I've lost many friends just because I stopped smoking weed. I mean, come on. They don't want anything better for our lives, but I get to tell them now that the reason I don't is because Christ is alive and well, and he's praying for me, he's praying for you, in the sanctuary of heaven. Amen? Amen. And it says, right here at the end, they realized, now when they had saw the boldness of Peter and John, they realized that they had been with Jesus. So the leaders of Israel knew the character of Christ. They denied him as the Son of God, but they knew his character. They knew he was humble. They knew that he was loving. He was compassionate. He was bold in the way he spoke parables to them and called them out of being hypocrites. So whenever he sees, the same goes for us. People nowadays, they know the character of Christ. They know they say he was a good man, a good teacher, all of those things. They help the poor. But when we go against that, they know that our fruits are not the same as Christ. Matthew tells us, or Jesus tells us in the book of Matthew, that we should let our light so shine before men that they see our good works and we glorify our Father in heaven. Amen? So we take all the glory away from ourself, just with any type of your conversion, the, the fruit of humility, repentance, None of that is yours. It's all to the grace of God. Now, the take-home points, I hope here, pretty simple, is to be humble like Christ, right? Now, what does this mean in our own life? That you'd have to answer on your own. I, can't answer that. I can answer that for Daniel. I can't answer that for anyone else. Point number two, have confident faith like Jesus. Because there's going to come a time when we'll be taken up to trial. Will we stand and be confident as Christ, suffering the death of the cross? Will we go to the torture rack with the joy knowing that God is able to raise us again in the day of the resurrection? Point number three, and to claim Jesus. This is, can happen in many different ways. Um, I think even Dr. Kirko said this last week, is... Um, what was it um, he likes to preach a sermon and then sometimes he likes to talk as well something of that nature our actions speak louder than words and we know that saying will we be fruitful and multiply Christians as we were told to do and just a quick note 
Um, this is a process of convert or uh, sanctification. It does not happen overnight. There are those um, great testimonies that you can find all over the internet where people say, you know, just overnight they quit whatever it was they were doing. Their um, lives have significantly changed. But this is a process of sanctification, and we believe that it is only by a relationship of Jesus on a daily basis that we are able to change gradually, to be a people fit for the kingdom of heaven. If you improve by 1% every day, 1% doesn't seem like much, but if you improve 1% every day, by the end of this year, because it's a leap year, you will have improved by 366%. <laughs> and as our singers are coming forward, just to go back to that story that, um, at the beginning of our sermon here, um, the man was uh, very much a blasphemer of God, drug addict, uh, disrespected parents, broke all of the commandments, right? But after he truly gave his heart to the Christ, he had been doing, he's been done Bible studies, he's taken on various roles in the church, he's uh, preached a sermon or two. Um, the things that he once did have fallen off, and he no longer loves to do those things. This is what conversion does. We can sit in these pews all day, but if we're not spending time with Christ the six other days, coming here is nothing. So I pray, as Jesus said, when you're converted, strengthen your brethren. I pray that this sermon has uh, strengthened you today. Please stand and join us as we sing our closing hymn, He's Ever Over Me. promise that he's ever over us if we'll bow our hearts and our minds we will before the Lord dear Heavenly Father
Um, Lord, we just want to pray for the Holy Spirit to be working on our heart to convert us, to strengthen the brethren. Um, Lord, we see the birth pains that are all around us in this world. Um, we just pray, Lord, that we would follow the Lamb whithersoever it goes and that we would be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Lord, may we um, honor you not only with our lips, but with our heart as well. May we not be as the Pharisees and be um, as dead men's bones inside of this chest. And we pray, Lord, um, that as we go, that you will keep us safe, that you will keep us and bless us. In Jesus' name, amen.